today we have uh, Jason McPhee, a mechanical engineer for the state of California, and Lee Welter, a uh, Sacramento physician and adjunct faculty teaching EMS, Emergency Medical Services, at uh, American River College. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. We're on the air on uh, Channel 17 Sacramento on the web at www.access. Sacramento.org. Airtimes are 8 p.m. Thursdays, noon Fridays, 4 a.m. Saturdays. Uh, archived at uh, YouTube and other channels, other cable channels around the area. Uh, the uh, campaign, the 2016 presidential campaign, uh, was a, a lot about about the lack of jobs caused by uh, immigrants and Chinese and Mexicans all taking our jobs which really isn't the case. The case really is about robots taking our jobs, about the mechanization of a whole lot of jobs in the United States. Is there a worry, is there a concern that uh, robots will take all of our jobs, leading to uh, a return of the Luddites? Jason. Yeah. I, you know, I, I know there's been a lot of fear, and I, I've seen, you know, Zuckerberg and Bill Gates have been out there uh, expressing their concerns on this, but <clears throat> to me, I, I, I have a hard time seeing where that's a major concern. I mean, uh, almost all of our technological event innovations have led to jobs that didn't exist a long time ago. I mean, you look at even uh, an airplane, you know, uh, displacing some other forms of transportation in the past. Suddenly there's jobs flying airplanes and being stewardesses in airplanes, and uh, ground crews for airplanes. So the idea that uh, we have to necessarily be, <coughs> even look at our cell phones. I mean, all of these jobs creating apps and other things that we didn't have before uh, is just uh, always opening up, freeing us up from trivial things to do new and exciting things. So There's another aspect of that, and that's uh, economic reality. I heard an interview once with uh, uh, the... Uh, CEO of CKE Enterprises, Carl Karcher Enterprises, and this is the man who was uh, Mr. Puzder, who was almost in the, became the labor secretary. Carl, Carl Jr. Exactly, yeah. Carl's Jr. in Hardy's restaurants. Yeah. He said that at that time, each of their employees was earning $6,000 a year for the company, for the parent company. That's not a bad deal, really, because people are earning money and paying their bills, and the business is going to stay afloat. However, he said if the minimum wage creation of government, unfortunately, were raised to $15 an hour, CKE would lose $6,000 a year for each employee. So the natural consequence is, you know, when you roll into a Carl's Jr., you don't say, Oh, give me uh, one of these special burgers with this, that, and the other thing. You look at the screen and you touch the screen <laughs> where you want. That's automation and it's increasing productivity. One of my favorite stories came from Milton Friedman, who made a visit to India where the uh, productivity or the uh, building infrastructure was being shown off. Uh, his guide, showed him, look what we're doing. I forget if it was a highway or bridge or some such thing. And uh, Milton Friedman asked, well, why aren't you using power tools? It would be a lot quicker and easier and certainly cost effective. And the guy said, oh, you don't understand, Professor Friedman. One of the, quite, one of the uh, benefits and objectives of this project is to create jobs for our people, to which Milton Friedman asked, well, in that case, why don't you take away their shovels and give them spoons? That's what we call job creation. And there is a difference between create, uh, being productive and having a job. And uh, the, one of the world uh, pioneers in the concept of um, cybernetics, augmenting human capabilities, uh, Norbert Wiener titled his book on the human use of human beings. Is it really a human use if somebody is doing something that a machine could do as well or better? I'd say let the machines do the work for us. 
they don't complain about working conditions as long as they're maintained adequately and I work 24 hour shifts. <laughs> yeah, I was going to jump into oh, something you were saying earlier about the uh, minimum wage at the fast food restaurants, you know, driving away the jobs uh, in favor of technology. And, and one of the things there, too, you can think of it as not necessarily the technology getting the job, but it was really the government distortion that raised the price that killed the job, you know. So it's not. It's not necessarily, I, I guess it's unfair to think of it as that technology because the technology never would have been employed were it not for the distortion. There was, there was no real so. need. In fact, the sad thing about that is that it takes the people with the, the least skill, the least employable in a way, it cuts them out from the entry-level job. If somebody's able to earn $6,000 a year for a company, they're going to be employed and they will learn how to be timely, how to deal courteously with the public, and a lot of other things that are essential to productivity, and they're shut out of that by having a minimum wage. Except for some of the unions got exempted from that, didn't they? Cut special deals uh, for special interests. Well, and, and, the, and, and there, there are two other aspects to the whole, the scare, the Luddite scare about robot, robotization, robotization, and that is that if you, if you look back Couple three hundred years, you know, say back to the time of the Luddite, the actual Luddites who were uh, the weavers complain, complaining about weavers, loom, looms taking yes. the jobs away from the people who were you know working at spinning wheels, uh, or, or whatever the heck they were doing before before looms. I don't even yes. know. Taking away jobs that existed. Well, if you think about it, uh, primitive man, you know, uh, uh, would you know hunt and gather. Uh, hunt with a bow and arrow at some point, even before that, hunting with, with snares and, and, you know, gathering roots and vegetables. Uh, and the, you know, as recently as a couple, three hundred years ago, the lifespan was, you know, if you lived into your 40s, you were, or even your 30s, you were an old man. Yes. Uh, because you did not succumb to disease or succumb to uh, uh, accidents or, or other uh, ills. Uh, so you end up with, and, and you were probably working, uh, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, you know, all through daylight in order to stay to, alive. In order to get enough uh, food to stay alive and get back to the cave for you know some rudimentary shelter. Yes. So you worked huge long hours in order to just barely exist. Now we're working. I think it's down to 35 hour uh, as standard work week to exist in a very very comfortable manner. Even 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 the mo even the poorest among us. Is living quite comfortably in uh, luxury if, by you know, many as long, standards. As long as they're not pushed out of a job by minimum wage, that you know, which is a, a totally different issue. But everybody lives; the poorest among us live at a at a, uh, a uh, sustenance level that was better than kings a couple three hundred years ago. And you think about that. I mean, if you go to sleep and you have a CD player or something listening to a symphony. Uh, you've essentially disemployed a whole orchestra that would have otherwise having to be putting putting you to sleep. <laughs> very, very true. So, yes, for so those who could afford it. <laughs> yes. So, so, so you end up with people. You know, the the benefit of letting the machines do it. You don't have to work as hard. You don't have to work as many hours. Yes. And the productivity is still there. So you're not sacrificing uh, goods produced or. Uh, uh, financial well-being or economic growth, the economic growth continues even though the, the actual labor put into the uh, process uh, gradually goes down. Yes, but there was a time when um, agriculture or growing or developing food, um, uh, farm animals and crops and the like, uh, took most of the population working yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. long at, at the beginning of the country, uh, you know, beginning of the United States, ninety-five percent of the population work on the farm. Yes. Now, less than five percent works on the farm and produces food not only for the United States but for a big chunk of the rest of the world. Yes, it th thanks in large part to uh, mechanization. I, and I can speak personally to that. I oh, grew up on a farm. Oh, I grew farm up boy. on a farm, and when I was growing up, when I was a very small child, my dad farmed with horses. That shows you how old I am. He had a team of horses, and uh, they would pull a, a, a two-bottom or a single-bottom plow uh, to plow the fields, and they would, uh, would you know, you would harvest the uh, the grain by pulling a, a windrower machine by horse, 
which would, and then the, the, the machine would turn the grain into shocks, or in, into, yeah, into shocks, and then you would take a pitchfork and load the shocks onto a, onto a wagon, haul the wagon to a, a stationary thresher where you would thresh the, the, uh, the grain to take out the, uh, to remove the wheat or the oats from the, from the shaft or the straw. That was a long, time-consuming, labor-intensive process. It was replaced by a combine. Once across the field, you had your corn, you had your oats, you had your, your wheat. That's been replaced with a, a two-row combine with a 24-row combine. <laughs> so now the combine and the, and the, you know, it used to be when you would grow corn, you would go across the field to plow the field, you'd go across the field after that disc, you'd go across the field one more time to drag, to break up the soil, then you'd go across the field a fourth time to plant, a fifth time to rotary hoe to get rid of the small weeds before you could cultivate, then you go across the, cor the, the, the field four times cultivating the corn to keep the weeds down, so that's, I think we're up to nine now, then you go across the field to harvest, to, to pick, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, you, you go across the field after that to disc before you plow it. So, you know, probably a dozen times across the field. Now, farmers go across the field twice. Once to plant, once to harvest, and it's done, in many cases, with a GPS system that tells the uh, planter how much fertilizer to put next to each seed that's planted. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah, and I was just going to tell you, you say wonderful. I mean, this should be a celebration of human ingenuity and achievement, uh, intellectual achievement, not a lamentation of, of, of a loss of hard work, I guess. Yes, but then there's another, there's some other sad aspects to this. One is that it takes power for these machines, fuel, uh, electrical, or what have you, and that produces carbon dioxide the basis of life. And there are people that are bemoaning that. They don't like the basis of life. Take all the carbon well, dioxide out of our atmosphere and what happens? Yeah. The plants die and then the animals die. And, and even if you're worried about, about carbon dioxide, too much of it being produced, when you're going across a farm field twice as opposed to a dozen times, you're, 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 more efficient. you're producing a heck of a lot less uh, carbon dioxide. But uh, some of these machines probably require a big capital investment. They have to be expensive. And uh, are some of the farmers relying on contractors who go from one farm to the next uh, providing these yeah. services? Yeah, and the other thing, of course, that's happening is when you're farming the way my dad did. He farmed 160 acres, and that was a whole lot of uh, land to be farming with, uh, yes. you know, with uh, uh, small equipment. Now you're farming probably 1,600 acres or more because one person can still do all of that very easily. Uh, and so the, you know, the size of farms has uh, increased. That's why the farm population has gone from 95% of the, of the population down to you know, less than 5%, maybe 2 or 3 And the number of starving people in the world are decreasing, diminishing, except for places like uh, North Korea and what, Venezuela. And they have something in common, don't they? Yes. <laughs> you know, there was one other thing I was going to mention, too. You know, I, th I think with Zuckerberg and Gates, they have this dystopian view as though it, 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 the market will be like a switch, I guess, where at some point an invention will come along and, and all the jobs will just sort of start to disappear. And I think in, in reality, the market doesn't really work that way. I mean, it, it's as you described with the... Uh, uh, the, the plowing, it, 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 it happens in increments and, and as the jobs disappear, uh, investment decisions are made, there's constant feedback in markets, so there's not just this, this one thing that is going to be invented where just jobs will suddenly disappear. It also, I was reminded uh, fairly recently that there are some people believe that our world population is far too large. We need to eliminate a lot of people or cult growth. Uh, take the Chinese approach. Was it one child per family? Was it at one time? That or was two? Mao's idea, yeah. Well, of course, the, the proponent of that was Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb back in the 19, uh, either late 60s or early 70s. And he was predicting that by the 90s, that uh, th there would be mass starvation because the uh, population of the earth would be unsustainable in terms of food production. He, of course, uh, made a bet, a very famous bet, with the economist <laughs> Julian Simon. Julian Simon said, you know, I, I think you're wrong. He had started out being a believer in zero population mm -hmm. growth and the, uh, the, the problems that, uh, 
that that, that might cause. But he, did, he, was a, he was an economist, so he did a lot of empirical research and came to the conclusion that the opposite was, was true and that uh, the, the humans are the ultimate resource. The human ingenuity is what makes everything yes. work a lot better as opposed to human grunt work or human labor. So he said, you know, as I, as I look at the data, as I look at the actual statistical evidence, I see that more mechanization, more people creates more prosperity, more consumption creates more productivity. It's, it's, it's a virtuous circle. Yes. And I will bet you, uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich, that rather than mass starvation in the 90s, there will be plenty. And what we'll use to determine whether or not I win the bet or you win the bet is the price of commodities. I bet the pri commodity prices will go down and Ehrlich took the other side of the bet and lost handily. Now, to Ehrlich's credit, he paid, his, uh, he paid off the bet. But he's still, okay. I think, at Stanford, proselytizing the same, the same, <laughs> the same, the same line or something. something well, like that. it's hard to change. It's difficult for people to change their religion. Uh, well, that's one of the interesting things about that particular incident, too. Is that, um, it, you know, scientists are great at identifying problems and seeing this as a rate of use. And, you know, gosh, if I just project this out over a certain amount of time, this is going to, you know, disappear. But the problem is, is that it, it. it these models with people include human behavior, and so you know, when when you include uh, people, change their behavior with respect to scarcities. And it's so, not a static world. Exactly, yeah, and so I, and, and and prices actually help to reflect that scarcity. So it's a, it's a, I guess you know you really need to have economists and scientists, you know working hand in hand on some of these issues and not just... Or just the market. You don't really exactly. need economists to describe sure. it, although exactly. that comes in handy every once in a while to provide a theoretical framework. But if you simply have a society where the government essentially stays out of marketplace decisions, sure, uh, other than protecting the environment, you know, doing a few, you know, protecting people from force and fraud and, and other, you know, yes. night watchman's type, of, type role. If you, as long as you provide uh, a safe place to do business, the businessmen will take care of making sure that the right decisions are made because it's in their interest to do so. It's the purest and most productive form of democracy where people vote with their dollars. You go to the grocery store and say, I like this product and... And, and where creative destruction is allowed, to, uh, is allowed to carry, you know, is allowed to happen. We have a situation, uh, you know, I think probably best exemplified by the banking crisis from 2008. We had a situation where the banks overextended themselves. It's a lot more complicated than that. The Federal Reserve System and our central banks made it possible for banks to overextend themselves. But in fact, the largest mega banks in the, in the country, the Goldman Sachs, the uh, JP Morgan, the uh, Wells Fargo and so forth, they were all overextended in housing loans and other loans. So instead of failing like banks used to do when and they- And should have done. And should, and should have happened. They were bailed out by the federal, by the government, in effect, by the Federal Reserve by System. By us, we're paying for their mistakes. Right, and as a result, the problem of overextension, the problem of too much debt in the system, was never remedied. We still have way too much debt in the system, and now it's just bubbling up with student loans and car loans, and consumer loans and corporate debt. It's just gone to a different place other than housing. Although housing is getting, is starting to get, look a little bit bubblicious now too. <laughs> so, you know, you have to have the ability for institutions and for people to fail in order for uh, room to be made for other institutions and people and businesses to uh, come in and pick up the pieces and, and uh, do something a little bit different and a little bit more successful. And there has to be some moral hazard so that people can get the proper signals of what they should be doing yes. in the market. Oh, yeah, with, with, when you take away moral hazard and make it, make it impossible to fail, that might work very nicely for Johnny in kindergarten, although I think it probably sends the wrong signal. Definitely. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't work in the real world if you want to maintain a vibrant, successful, and prosperous economy. You just have to have the ability to fail, and fail early and fail often, and eventually you'll succeed. Definitely. The entrepreneurial uh, 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 cradle. Uh, moving a little bit farther into this issue, as, as biotech, and artificial intelligence begin to merge, uh, which is starting to happen. Are we, uh, are we transforming humans into immortal godlike beings? Uh, an author by the name of Laval Harari, he's the author of A Brief History of Tomorrow, is asking that question. 
Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's uh, one of those things you can just see our cell phones and we, we sit here and we use them and, and my gosh, we, we can just pull up information at the touch of a button that we, you know, would have been stretching for in the past and we can just see this continuing uh, on, this trend. And, um, you know, we're, we're implementing ourselves with medical devices to, to make ourselves be able to last longer. And, and, uh, but uh, I guess the, the, the most impressive part, though, is just what we're able to do with our minds, you know, with the uh, It's extending computers. human capabilities, not replacing them, and there is a difference. In fact, uh, uh, was it Albert Einstein? You remember that guy? He said something about imagination and creativity is far more important than pretty much any other characteristic sure. in terms of human productivity. When think of this one thing, it's, it's almost maybe a bit of our evolution as a species. I mean, this internet now where we're all sort of sharing information in rapid fire, you know, uh, in rapid fire fashion with each other and able to, to, you know, I remember when I was a kid, we had these Funk and Wagnall encyclopedias and, you know, you'd, <laughs> oh, sure. you'd get these That's things on the deal. shelf, yeah, and you'd, you'd eventually assemble them from the grocery store or someplace else. <laughs> and and you, you kept those things forever because it cost a fair amount yes. of money, you know, and you didn't want to break up the set. And, of course, you know, they'd be outdated by the time you got the last one. Now, you know, a Wikipedia or something else is being updated by somebody you don't know, you know. At uh, no cost to you. At no cost to you, exactly, you know, at, at uh, a moment's notice. So it, it's really fascinating the way we're evolving on some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you take a look, at you know, this this thing has more computing power than the, <laughs> the Apollo moon mission, yeah. which is, you know, and, and you know, w w things within my lifetime, probably not yours. But. Oh, no, I, I, well, maybe not <laughs> Jason's, but no, I've, I've seen it happen. In fact, I worked, it was in 1969 to 1971 in a hospital that had one of the first computer-based medical applications. It permitted people to sit at a terminal and uh, and describe their own medical history to a certain extent, not into great granular detail, but give a good overview. Uh, at the time, the dis video displays were so expensive, the cathode ray tubes, remember the little orange yeah. bouncing dot? Uh, instead, the very clever engineers used a Kodak carousel projector, which had space for 80 slides. The engineers developed a system of shutters and lenses that let them divide each of those into quadrants. So there were four times 80, 320 different displays that could be presented. And they would ask a question and say, have you ever been a cigarette smoker? Or are you a cigarette smoker? And you could say, no, never, or yes, but I quit. And whatever, and then the next question is, uh, do you still smoke? Do you have any symptoms? Do you have a cough, chronic cough, et cetera? And go out into those branches. And uh, it was, in terms of the hardware, it was pretty primitive, but the software was relatively sophisticated. And the only complaint I heard about it was from some physicians said, well, if this problem is on the medical record, then I have an obligation to follow up on it. That's not why I brought the patient to the hospital. I brought them to the hospital to fix their hernia or repair their broken ankle or something of the sort, and not to find out about their smoking history and their chronic cough and the like, but, but far beyond that now. In 1961, during the John F. Kennedy administration, per capita federal taxes were $4,121 in 2016 dollars. And John F. Kennedy, as a Democrat, wanted to cut taxes back, back then. It was you know, a little over $4,000. In 2016, federal per capita taxes are up to $10,114. So 145% uh, increase. Question, are we getting 145% more for our money today than we were in 1961? We're getting more complicated and more regulations and more overhead and more burdens, but um, we're not the ultimate beneficiaries of that. If you want to learn about the beneficiaries, I recommend either one or both of two books. One that I mentioned on a show a few months back uh, by Lawrence Lindsay, titled uh, Conspiracies of the uh, Ruling Class. 
The other one was by uh, uh, Peter Schweitzer. It was called uh, Extortion. And the latter asked or posed the question of why do we have such complicated regulations? No reasonable person can look at those regulations and make any sense out of them. But some very crafty people developed those regulations to be intentionally very complicated and difficult to, uh, to adhere to so that they can become consultants. <laughs> and you're having trouble running your business without running afoul of the law? Don't worry, I'll protect you. I created these regulations and I know how to navigate the, uh, the minefield that they represent. Speaking of regulations, federal regulatory costs last year came to 1.9 trillion, that's a T, trillion with a T, dollars. Uh, that comes out to $5,300 approximately per person in regulatory costs. Uh, that's per person, every man, woman, and child. Uh, do you think that's a big part of the, the current economic uh, recovery, why the uh, current economic recovery is limiting at, uh, at, at a couple percent as opposed to three to six percent previously? Well, I wonder when people talk about recovery, it makes me think of a pilot in a um, in a, a stall spin, it's a so-called death spiral. And is, is this a recovery when you're headed towards the ground? Eventually you're gonna hit, come down to the earth, but uh, when you're piloting a plane, it's not such a great idea. And when you're worried about economic conditions, the death spiral is probably not a good idea either. Okay, we take the two questions, uh, the uh, cost of you know, the high taxes and regulatory costs, is that why the number of U.S. citizens who have renounced their citizenship has grown from 231 uh, as recently as 2008 to 400, uh, 5,411 uh, last year. You think there's a, a correlation here by any chance? Well, I talked to one a few days ago. Uh, this is somebody who is uh, re undoubtedly receiving a pension from... Got a uh, quick answer here. Oh, uh, he showed me his green card. He's a Mexican citizen now. He's got, he'd get his pension and, and his wife's pension come from uh, city or state of uh, California. That's the show. We'll see you again All next right. week, same time, same place on the Libertarian <laughs> Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields, and uh, we appreciate you being with us. Have a good night. All right. And good night, Jeremy, wherever you are. <laughs>